got 20 minutes to tell you a little bit about um, neuroscience and emotional intelligence. Now, I'm guessing that you wouldn't be here if you didn't already know something about it. And I have to say, um, whilst I am studying neuroscience, I don't profess to be a neuroscientist. It's much more the practical application of. So I thought we'd have a bit of fun um, this afternoon to sort of liven things up. So what I'm going to ask you to do, you see the pictures on the screen here. There's a card situated roughly between your legs underneath your seat, and you will find a picture card. What I'm going to ask you to do is look at that picture and decide whether it represents you in a best mood, your perception of a best mood, or a worst mood. So for instance, for me, I'm going to choose the picture in the middle on the screen here. Let's imagine I've found that one under my chair. That would represent me in my best mood for several reasons. One, it's colourful. I feel more colourful when I'm in my best mood. Um, there's also a lot of energy, and I feel more energetic when I'm in my best mood. But the other thing you'll see there is the, the horse at the front, the carousel horse, is very, very focused, as in it's clear and in focus. And when I'm in my best mood, I feel like I'm very attentive, very focused. The impact on the people around me is that focus and that energy makes them feel that they can achieve more as well as me feel like I can achieve more. So what I'm going to ask you to do is you look at your picture... Is it more you in your best mood or you in your worst mood? And I'd like you to just quickly describe it to the person next to you exactly as I've just done, as how does it represent you, what do you like, and how does it impact your behaviour and the people around you? You have about one and a half minutes, so go. <laughs> OK, ladies and gentlemen, time is up. <laughs> thank you for that. So, and thank you for being so... So on the ball, that's very helpful. So um, let me just hear a few examples, and you might have to yell out. What about best mood? What are some of the themes of best mood? Colour. Best mood, colourful, OK? So we had more colour with the best mood. What else? What do you like in your best mood? OK, nature, people. Yeah, we're more connected to people. We're more approachable when we're in our best mood. Say again, Ali. Growing, we feel like we can grow more. Does other people find that? You feel like you can achieve more freedom, flexibility, etc. Anything else? Good. Energy, feeling good. Yeah, we feel good, which makes the people around us feel good. Open. Ah, we're more smiling, we're more open, more approachable. Wonderful. Less okay. judgmental. Oh, good. Okay, so we're more open in our thinking. Excellent. All right, let's think about worst mood. So what were some of the themes of worst mood? <laughs> okay, so for some people, maybe loud and noisy. It may be different for others. What else? Our lack, uh, lack of choice. Yeah, we feel our world is narrowed sometimes when we're in our worst mood. What else? Speed, speed and not being present. Okay, so we're not present. We're not as attentive. We're not as focused. Excellent. Dull and boring. What was that one? Dull and boring. Oh, yes, we are more dull and boring when our worst mood. Nobody wants to be around us when we're miserable. Ah, uh, we feel isolated. We feel restricted. Think about it for a moment. When we're in our worst mood, we often go into ourselves. Would that be fair? Some of you may be more explosive, and maybe people don't want to be around you. But, <laughs> but generally speaking, worst moods mean contraction away from people. Best moods tend to mean connection with people. And as you've already heard, and as some of you know from positive psychology, connecting with people is a really important thing for our flourishing and growth. I'm going to talk to you about a simple way of thinking about the brain. Now, I could use big technical terms, but generally speaking, I like to use simple ones because that's just me. I tend to be a simple person. Um, so I'm going to draw you a brain. I'll just move this forward so that the people over the other side can see. Now, this particular brain, it's not to scale. I appreciate it may look more like a kidney, um, but just bear with me here. <laughs> a lima bean, thank you. I'm going to talk to you about the triune brain. I'm sure many of you have heard the triune brain. I'm going to try and talk to you relatively quickly because it just enables you to think of things quite simply. Triune brain meaning three parts. Now, a lot of neuroscientists will probably be turning in their graves because I keep it very simple, but this is often colloquially called the reptilian brain. If you imagine your spine going up and sitting right on top, we have this oldest part of the brain, the reptilian part of the brain, sometimes called the lizard brain. Responsible for three primary drivers. Who'd like to tell me what they are? Sex. Thank you. I'm glad that one came up first. <laughs> 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 
No, I heard a few here. Eat, sleep, sex. Well, survival is elements of survival, but we'll get on to other elements of survival in a moment. But if you think about the reptilian brain, we all have one. It's responsible for primary drivers. If you're a crocodile, this is it for you. It's pretty much all you get. <laughs> and think about that for a minute, how simple life is. You don't have to worry about, are you going to get promoted next week? You don't have to think, oh, I do I like fat today? <laughs> None of that to worry about, because just primary drivers. Eat, sleep, reproduce. All right, then on top of that, sort of more, again, it's not to scale, but if you imagine my hand sinking down through my head, you'll hit your limbic brain, which is, if you like, your emotional center. It's your relationship center. It's your empathy, your connection to people. Um, it's also part of your automatic processes. So your basal ganglia, which was responsible for your habits, sits in there. Your hippocampus, which is, if you like, your memory center, sits in there. So if I think about this part of the brain, if you think about it as quite automatic, it can sometimes help you. So it's sometimes called the reflexive system. Obviously, it's not as simple as just one part of the brain, but I'm trying to keep it simple. So the reflexive system, it's very automatic. When you're asleep, this part of your brain is still busy doing its thing. If you want to think about the automaticity of it, those of you wearing trousers this morning, did you make a conscious choice which leg to put in first? You probably did if you've got an injury. <laughs> but if you haven't, you don't consciously go, do you know what, I'm going to try my right leg this morning because I did my left yesterday. <laughs> yeah? It's not a conscious thing, it's a habit. Hopefully you cleaned your teeth this morning. Hopefully it wasn't too, didn't require too much willpower. Didn't require you to go, do you know what, I'm going to stick a note on my mirror last night so I make sure I do it this morning. And yet if you've got a three-year-old child, mm, maybe not a habit yet. All right, so very automatic, doesn't require much fuel to work. And I'm going to talk to you briefly about the fuel in a moment. Then, of course, on top of this here, if you like, if you slap yourself on the forehead, you've got your prefrontal cortex, which, again, if you want to think about it simply, is your thinking brain. It's responsible for strategizing, making decisions, um, thinking, self-regulation, paying attention, all of that sort of thing, which requires a lot of fuel. And again, we'll talk about fuel in a moment. So if you think about emotional intelligence, a simple way I like to think about it is these two parts of the brain talking to each other. We're experiencing something in our limbic system. We think about it. We make a decision about how we're going to act. And we send a message down to our body accordingly. Does that make sense? Yeah? However, have any of you ever had one of those moments where you experience a strong emotional reaction and you have an area of your limbic system called your amygdala, two little almond-shaped thingies either side in your limbic system, and they fire really strongly when you experience a strong negative emotion like fear, anger, anxiety, etc. Have you experienced one of those moments where you've had a very strong emotional response and it's almost like these two parts of the brain stop talking to each other and this part of the brain all by itself sends a message down to your body usually your mouth, <laughs> and something comes out and you think, ooh, have you had one of those? Yeah, you kind of wouldn't be human if you hadn't. <laughs> All right, so think about that for a moment and think about why it happens. Emotional intelligence, keeping those connected, it's the resilience you have when you have an emotional response and then you think it through and you manage your emotions. When we're being emotional is when, if you like, this bit takes over. And this bit is part of our survival element. So if you think about the fuel involved, think about the fuel involved in ex when you experience a negative emotion. So if you experience stress, anxiety, fear, anger, what sort of fuel or neurotransmitters do you produce? Cortisol and? Adrenaline, thank you. Cortisol and adrenaline. Did you know cortisol actually helps you put on fat cells and weight around your belly? If you don't know that, then it's about time you stop being stressed because it could be that and not the chocolate or the beer. <laughs> Unlikely, but it might be. Um, adrenaline, what's adrenaline for? Fight or, Fight or flight, wonderful. Adrenaline goes to my heart, my lungs, my big muscles to prepare me to run or punch someone. Yeah, it's not fuel for my brain. It's fuel for my body to keep me alive. From what you've heard today or what you've learned beforehand, because I know many of you have got lots of experience in here, 
What type of fuel does your brain like? Oxygen is one. Okay. Glucose is another. What are the neurotransmitters? Dopamine, a big one, dopamine. It needs things like serotonin, oxygen, um, oxytocin is useful, glucose, all those sorts of things. But dopamine is a big one. So think about this for a moment. Think about the last time you had an amygdala hijack, when your amygdala hijacked the rest of your brain. My guess would be that you were probably tired, stressed, under pressure when that happened. Would that be fair for many of you? Yeah, you know how you hold it together and you regulate yourself all day at work? And then you get home and the kids have to do one thing or your partner and you kind of lose it? Think about that. Potentially, you may not have enough fuel in your tank. Remember how this bit's very automatic? This bit requires lots of fuel. In order to be able to think and self-regulate your emotions, you need fuel, you need dopamine. Now, it sounds quite simplistic, but again, I'm a simplistic person. I often think about, if I know I'm tired or feeling a bit grumpy, etc., I often think about going to a fuel station. As in, how do I get more dopamine in my brain to allow me to think clearly, make good decisions, strategize, self-regulate, and pay attention? <laughs> and there's all sorts of ways we can do that. Sex would be a good one. Um, my husband would be very happy you said that. <laughs> but, but things like, simple things like exercise, good diet, sleep is useful. Um, but ironically, and somebody said it here earlier, positive emotions. Isn't it wonderful that positive emotions produce what we need? So if you think about the basic premise of neuroscience, this is a basic premise, and it's called the walk towards runaway theory. What that means is the brain walks to the towards emotions, the positive emotions, as in it plods, it gets there slowly, it might get distracted now and again but it is going to run as quickly as it possibly can to the away emotions, to the threat emotions. Why does it do that? Yep, survival. It's your fight or flight, it's your survival mechanism. You want your brain to do that. You want your brain to get to that side of things as quickly as possible. It's going to save your life. If someone is coming at you with a knife, could fear save your life? Absolutely, you run faster, you've got away. Could anger save your life? Could joy and elation save your life? You may distract them. <laughs> Stab me here, please. <laughs> so what we know from the basic premise of the human brain is we are wired for a stronger threat response. We know that away emotions are faster, stronger, longer, more common, adrenaline goes up, and interestingly, the fuel you need to think clearly, dopamine, goes down. Positive emotions, slower, milder, shorter, less common, dopamine goes up, adrenaline goes up a little, and we need a bit of adrenaline, it keeps us on our toes. But think about that for a moment in the way that you work, in the way that you live your life, in the way that you teach your kids. Our brain is primed to the negatives. It's why positive psychology has made so much headway into how we can help people flourish. Because actually our positive emotions help us in so many ways, but it's a not a natural thing and we have to make an effort. Sometimes we have to stop and savour. Savour the moment, which I know B. Alan Wallace was talking about, paying attention, being focused, savouring right here, right now, because it can help produce the fuel that we need being joyous and happy, jumping for joy. When was the last time you jumped for joy? I heard that at a conference the other day, and the, the guy asking it, um, Shannon Ponton from The Biggest Loser, those of you know, he asked a lady in the audience, she said it was 25 years ago. <laughs> I'm like, come on! <laughs> so positive emotions can do so much for us, not just because they feel nice. It's not about being happy and joyous all the time. It's about the positive emotions help produce the fuel we need to think clearly, to pay attention, to self-regulate, to make good decisions, to strategize. And my guess is, for many of you at work, that's really important for you. So we need to keep that fuel there. You've been hearing a lot about neuroplasticity. It's one of the things I find absolutely fascinating. I don't know about you guys, but when I grew up, um, the training I had around the brain is you kind of got all your gray matter, all your neurons when you were born, and they kind of maybe reached their peak at about their 20s, and after that, they're all going to die off gradually. Yeah? I, that was the way I was pretty much taught about it. And I don't know why, but as a kid, I used to hit my head a lot. 
I was forever knocked over, unconscious, concussed, etc. And I used to be terrified. I was killing off all my neurons. It was so exciting when I learned that you can grow new ones. <laughs> and did you know the oldest recorded person growing a new neuron is 92 years old? Exactly. I want to be growing a new neuron at 92 years old. But the thing we also need to think about is how they affect us, how the brain changes. And this is the biggest bit of technical bit I'll get to. If you think about using your amygdala strongly, they've actually found over time, if we get stressed, pressures, ang anxious, angry, fearful, etc., regularly and trigger our amygdala, you see the top row, the blue ones. All those little um, sticks represent dendrites, and you've got the little blobs that poke off them that connect you to other things. So you've got your chemicals that release into the receptors of other neurons, etc. It actually grows in density. What do you think the implications are of growing density in your amygdala? More likely to trigger, isn't it? But look what happens to your hippocampus, which is your memory center. Certain things start to die off after a while. And they've actually done this study across a bunch of, um, recently a bunch of senior leaders over a three-month period to see what changes. And people started to forget things, started to lose track of what they were doing, not be able to draw on things as quickly in meetings. I wonder what the implications are for our prefrontal cortex if we can't do those things as well. And it's part of that neuroplasticity. But the thing we need to bear in mind is the impact of our emotions. I'm sure many of you know this. The picture on the top left for you, um, that's my blood. I had a live blood test. And you see how I've got a happy white blood cell? How cool is that? <laughs> had to get a picture. Um, Think about that. We know positive emotions help boost our immune system. We know they help us health-wise. We make better decisions when we're in a positive mood. We're more likely to make better choices about what we eat and what we do when we're in a positive mood. But equally, we can think more clearly when we're in a positive mood. Our emotions impact us in the way that we pay attention, focus, make decisions. And equally, they help us build relationships. A lot of great work by Nicholas Kostakis on connecting with relationships around positive emotions. I'm sure this is stuff you already know. One of the phrases we talk about in our business is you know it, do you do it? Many of us know this theoretically. I want you to do it. I want you to look at the back of your card right now before I have to be hauled off this stage. You will either have an inspirational quote or you will have an action to do with positive psychology and emotional intelligence. If you have a black one that's an action, that's your job by the end of today. Practice some of this. Practice it every day. Use them wisely. Don't let your emotions use you. Think about emotions as being data and information, and the better you harness that data and information, whether it's a negative or a positive, the better you can handle your life. Thank you for that. I hope that's given you something to think about. Thank you.